Every Halloween, our church does a haunted house fundraiser. It used to be in the school gymnasium, except last year, a couple of Karens decided this was unacceptable. According to them, only devil worshippers celebrate Satan's birthday. I'm not sure if they said that in a moment of anger or if they actually think Halloween is the celebration of Satan's birth, but I know I'm not willing to ask. The point is, it was an easy way for the church and the school to raise extra money. They recycle the same decorations every year and people are always donating new stuff. All of the kids love going, so everyone's parents helped out and it's just a simple tradition that we look forward to. But Karens will be Karens. Budgets had come to rely on that extra cash, and since my uncle had just moved to Florida, Dad volunteered his big empty house as an alternative location. It solved the immediate problem and gave everyone a year to either sort out the Karens or find a new venue. There wasn't much time to get the house ready, so me and a few friends helped set it up. At first, we didn't think we'd be able to use our normal sound effects, but with a few extra speakers, Dad and our youth pastor managed to make it work. Everyone was really excited to be finished. Due to the Karen circumstances, we had all been a little bitter and angry when starting out, but with a finished project before our eyes, we couldn't help feeling proud. The school's gym couldn't hold a candle to a real house with actual walls and staircases. It was like stepping into another world. We had so many people show up that we had to keep it open for the entire week. We had all the usual stuff, but we also had a guillotine, where people could actually stick their heads in for a picture. There were scary foods in the kitchen, like grape eyeballs and blood punch with sour worms. My mom dressed in an old colonial dress and hid in one of the bedrooms, while my little sister dressed up like a zombie and hid under the basement staircase. My favorite was the gauntlet, a small obstacle course in the backyard. Dad dressed as Jason and chased his victims. It was a simple setup, like crawling under a net or running through tires, but everyone had lots of fun with it. Well, mostly everyone. In the week we ran the haunted house, there were a few instances that none of us can explain. The first one was actually a complaint from one of the Karens, so it was initially dismissed without much consideration. She stormed out of the attic, exorcist scene, furious and clearly flustered. We had a child mannequin on a small bed covered in green slime. An emotion sensor would trigger the sound of a creepy little girl laughing when someone passed by. As far as sound effects go, that is the only thing that anyone should have heard in that room. But Karen was now swearing that an adult woman told her to die, cow. Mom tried telling her about the actual recording and offered to show her how it worked, but Karen refused to go back into the attic. She insisted that it couldn't have been a recording because she felt someone's breath in her ear. She just couldn't figure out how they got so close without her seeing. More and more it seemed like she was only trying to cause trouble, so Dad finally asked her to leave. She didn't go quietly, but she went and we all got back to work. The next night was even stranger. One of Dad's friends came to take a tour and give his review. It was mostly the usual stuff, but then he said Mom had genuinely frightened him. He wanted to know how she changed costumes and got into the attic so fast. Obviously, we told him that she only had one costume and never went into the attic, but he didn't believe us until Dad swore it genuinely wasn't part of the act. Finally, the friend told us that, just as he was leaving the room, he suddenly felt a chill and turned back to see a pale woman in a white dress staring at him from a dark corner. She was pointing and moaning something that sounded like, out, die, and now. He said the hairs on the back of his neck stood straight up, goosebumps broke out all over his body, and the part that frightened him the most, the woman's mouth opened too wide. He was so overcome with fear that he forgot he was supposed to be doing this for fun, his fight-or-flight response kicked in, and next thing he knew, he was halfway down the stairs. By the end of the story, no one knew what to believe. Mom felt like he was messing with them, but Dad swore his friend wouldn't joke like that, especially not without admitting it afterwards. Ultimately, it's what happened on Halloween night that turned us into true believers. 
My sister had gone trick-or-treating with friends, so it was only me and my parents, and the last crowd had just left. We were making sure that everything was turned off before heading home, when we suddenly heard footsteps walking above us, in the attic. But we were supposed to be alone in the house. Thinking some kids were trying to pull an all-nighter, the three of us went upstairs to check, and no one was there. We looked in every corner, under every surface. Even if it was too small for someone to hide there, we still looked. The room was completely empty. Then, a female voice moaned, Get out. It was loud and angry. Mom ran towards the door and I was close behind her, but it slammed shut in our faces. There was no draft. Nobody was near it. One second it was wide open and the next it was swinging shut with considerable force. We stood frozen in shock for a brief moment, but the door opened easily once we tried it. We left pretty quick after that and only returned when we had a group to help with the cleanup. So yeah, basically, I think we made a haunted house attraction out of a genuinely haunted house. This Halloween we rented a space, but... I have a feeling it won't be quite the same as last year. Halloween Ouija I squirmed in my seat, sandwiched between my closest friends, Megan and Josh, as we huddled together in Megan's room. It was Halloween night, and Megan's older sister had gone off to college, leaving behind a treasure trove of random relics, one that especially piqued our curiosity, the Ouija board. Feeling slightly nervous yet excited, we planned to contact the other side. Megan had read countless stories and claimed the board held the key to communicating with the spirits that roamed freely on Halloween. Igniting candles around the room, we dimmed the lights. As we settled on the floor, it was a mix of excitement and unease that lingered, as if we were doing something we didn't fully comprehend. Our shaky hands moved toward the board, and I placed my fingertips on the planchette. As a hardcore skeptic, disbelief was in my mind, but I couldn't help feeling curious about what awaited us. Is there anyone there? Megan asked with a tremor in her voice breaking the ominous silence. For a moment, nothing happened. Our eyes darted between each other, silently questioning the authenticity of the spirit board. Doubts were creeping in, convincing me that this was all nothing more than a game, and not a very fun one either. But then, slowly and deliberately, the planchette twitched beneath our trembling hands. It moved over the board seamlessly, and our hearts pounded in sync as we watched the planchette move to yes. We all exchanged wide-eyed glances, unable to believe what was happening, even though it was happening under our very fingertips. What is your name? I stammered. The planchette moved swiftly across the board's surface once again, as if guided by an invisible hand. It spelled E-L-L-I-O-T-T. A wave of coldness washed over the room. Though a skeptic, I had always been fascinated by the paranormal. Even still, the thought of an actual otherworldly presence sent a legit shiver down my spine. Sensing our apprehension, Elliot, assuming that was their name, began communicating with us. We asked a barrage of typical teenage questions, trying to discern whether they were just a figment of our subconscious or a genuine paranormal presence. The answers she provided left us stunned. We learned Elliot was a woman, 19 years old, she liked music, and she did not die in Megan's house. But eventually what started as curiosity quickly turned into genuine unease. Elliot's responses grew increasingly intense, meaning the planchette moved more erratically. One of her responses fell outside the simple yes and no. We didn't even ask anything, when suddenly she warned us to end the session. Her words, not ours. Megan asked if there were other spirits in the room. 
Elliot responded rapidly, first yes, then repeatedly spelling, bad, bad, bad. We decided at that moment we ought to take our new friend's advice and end the session. Our collective fear was making it impossible to continue playing, regardless of whether Elliot was real or not. We hastily closed the session, sliding the planchette off the board. I was tempted to dismiss the whole thing as a bizarre coincidence. But suddenly, looking around the room, shadows we had dismissed as mere tricks of candlelight seemed to morph into wraith-like figures, accompanied by unexplained footsteps throughout the house. However, the strangest, the most unsettling part, inexplicable bruises began appearing on our arms, as if we had been grabbed by invisible hands. We never knew for sure if it was all a result of an ominous connection we had made with Elliot, or if something far worse came through to us that Halloween night, but we certainly didn't play with that board anymore. In fact, that night, Megan made Josh take it home, and we just sort of never talked about it again. Sometimes Josh would bring it up, saying we could always try again since he had the board, and one year we even got half serious about it. Only, Josh couldn't find the board anywhere. To this day, we have no idea where it ended up.